west side of Chicago, a family of Czechoslovakian immigrants hears a knock at their front door. The mother of this clan, Barbara, opens the gateway to the home to find two boys the same age as her youngest son standing with hats in their hands. They had come to pay her condolences. A few days earlier on July 24th, 1915, Barbara's 20-year-old son was given the day off from his summer job at Western Electric. He chose to spend his free day how any other young lad would, a company picnic and tour around the Chicago River upon the SS Eastland. Shortly after its departure, however, the Eastland capsized, killing 844 people in one of the worst disasters in the history of the city. Barbara's son was among those listed as missing in the paper. But just as the boys at Barbara's door apologized for her loss, the young man, who would go on to have a Hall of Fame professional football playing and coaching career, and serve as the father of the NFL's Chicago Bears, appears behind her. The youngster had arrived late to the dock that Saturday, avoiding a potential watery grave before he had the chance to lead such a successful life. Barbara's last name, through marriage, was Hallis, and her son was George Hallis. I could gloss over the years of dozens of teams that played in the 1918 college football season and find ample amounts of ups and downs and hilarity, but I'm going to hold myself to three more outside Brown. So here they are, the four teams that defined the 1918 college football season. Okay, see, I'm already cheating because with my second school, I'm actually going to do a twofer. Two teams split the national title in 1918, Michigan and Pitt. The powers of college football in the 1910s were far different from the powers that exist today. Ivy League schools, all of which are no longer even in the FBS, captured each of the first 31 national championships before the turn of the 20th century. Only after 1900 did other teams start to chip at that veneer. Even then, Ivy League representatives won or shared 11 of the 17 championships from 1901 through 1917. Michigan and Pitt were two of the rare challengers to the Ivy League throne in that time. Michigan captured outright titles in its first two years under legendary head coach Fielding Yost in 1901 and 02, sharing the crown in 03 and 04. Pitt got in on the fun with a shared title in 1910, and although I mentioned in the previous video the national title winner from this season was unclear, technically the Panthers own an outright crown from 1916. Yost and Warner were two legends of coaching members of the College Football Hall of Fame's charter class. There's a good chance that if you're watching this video, you may have played in a Pop Warner Youth Football League. Yo stayed on board at Michigan for another decade, seeing the Wolverines through the transition from the old Ivy League days to the rise of new college football powers. Michigan won another national title under Harry Kipke in the 1930s, and since 1938, there's only been seven seasons in which the Wolverines haven't been ranked in the AP poll at some point. Warner left Pitt a few years earlier than Yost left Michigan, but the program saw plenty of success following his departure. Jock Sutherland led the team to another national title in 1937, and the school has maintained periods of relevancy as recently as the early 1980s. I know Pitt isn't exactly looked at as a marquee ACC program, but they have a richer history than most realize. You may also recognize the names of three other programs that went unbeaten and untied in 1918. Oklahoma, Texas, and Virginia Tech. This all to say, schools with established cultures and administrations break through catastrophic circumstances like a pandemic best. An Ivy League school hasn't so much as shared a national title since 1922, mostly because they don't give athletic scholarships, but the powers that be in college football made it through the season just fine. The same applies to college football and COVID-19. The Ohio States and Clemson's and Alabama's of the world will suffer the least, 
because they already have the recruiting pipelines and the funding and the winning traditions and the facilities and the brand in place to guide them through troubled waters. Now let's turn 180 degrees. Let's see what Baylor's outlook was entering 1918. Goodness, you have to love that early 20th century news writing style. From the Baylor Laureate's preview of Baylor's 1918 football team. Ahem. <coughs> Although some of the Texas schools have considerably more men enrolled than Baylor has, our men are showing great form, and Coach Mosley is rapidly building a machine that will be there when the whistle blows to open the season for Baylor, and will stay in the game until the last down on Thanksgiving Day. In the very next paragraph of the story, our writer admits Baylor returns literally zero varsity lettermen from the previous season. But that doesn't matter. It'll be a machine, right? After two games are canceled from SATC restrictions, the Bears get to see how well said machine runs. The university even hosts a football rally that is strongly encouraged for students because, quote, it's the pep behind the team that wins the games. No one is too busy to take off a few minutes to win a game. Okay. Baylor opened the season with a 7-6 loss to MacArthur Field thanks to a failed extra point attempt. And now is an L, but it was by just one point in a game scheduled last minute against a team with a former All-American in his late 20s at quarterback and a future foundational pro at tackle. Our friends at the Laureate still promise a prosperous season. Is one by a sports reporting just not a thing in 1918, or... Next week will be bet- Nope, regression! Baylor falls 26 to nothing to Baron Field, a dismantling by 1918 standards. Apparently the line was still... plucky, though. Seriously, is this paper actually run by the team or something? Can things improve in week three? Baylor gets to play actual college football programs now and not all-star air service academies they have no time to prepare for. They're even coming off a bye week. Nope. Baylor is pulled apart 19-0 by rival Texas A&M. They're shut out again the following week by SMU, then fall to Southwestern, parentheses Texas. So, Baylor is now 0-5 heading into its final game. They've scored 12 total points across said five games. TCU, Baylor's arch rival, is coming to town. A respectable 3-2 team who's beaten its last two opponents by a combined score of 64 to nothing. How could Baylor be expected to put up a fight? What Baylor faithful could find the will to support their team when losing seems so certain? On the latter... The school turned out in droves to support its team. I had doubts this was the case due to my <clears throat> light criticism <clears throat> of the laureate, but TCU's own student paper, the Skiff, felt the need to complain about mudslinging on their own front page two days later and mentioned there were twice the number of Baylor supporters there as TCU fans. Side note, the Skiff often uses we when referring to TCU's team and is also quite favorable to the Horned Frogs. I guess student newspapers were just expected to be openly biased toward their teams in 1918. As far as Baylor putting up a fight goes, this was an outstanding game. Oh, hold on. That's better. First, as with a lot of games in 1918, the field is a trough of mud. According to the skiff, outside runs are impossible because ball carriers simply slip. Second, I mentioned the fan support a bit ago. Based on the information from the two school papers, I'm estimating there were only about one to 2,000 spectators, but they are loud. The students are hurling constant memorized cheers and applause, enough to shake the foundations of the grandstand at Carroll Field. TCU took the ball down the field on its opening drive quickly advancing for a goal-to-go situation. But Baylor's line stood like a stone wall, the skiff said, and held for fourth and goal at the one-yard line. On fourth and goal, TCU's Henderson made one final plunge for the goal line. 
the bear stopped him six inches short. TCU marched into Baylor's red zone several more times in the first half, but each time the Bears' defense came up with a stop. The score was nothing, nothing at halftime. Special teams changed that in the third quarter. Backed up once again at its own end of the field, Baylor punted the football away to TCU's captain and star quarterback Brian Miller. The speedster grabbed the kick and raced untouched through the opposing punt unit for a 60-yard punt return touchdown leaving Baylor's wall-like defensive line on the sideline. The punt returner was also TCU's kicker, so he trotted out for the extra point and missed. It was 6-0. TCU's defense kept holding firm, and the Bears had to punt the football yet again. But Miller, now stringing together multiple mistakes, muffed a fair catch. Moody, one of Baylor's backs, plucked it out of the air off a bounce, got a block from teammate Steve Stevenson and dashed the remaining 30 yards for a touchdown. Stevenson booted home the extra point and the Bears led 7-6. That lead appeared a likely final score for most of the remaining game, but Baylor did grant TCU one final chance at a desperate comeback. With time winding down, TCU possessed the ball at Baylor's 30-yard line. Ben Parks, TCU's best thrower of the football, subbed in as an extra passing option in the backfield. Miller threw on the first two plays, but both fell incomplete. The Horned Frog scrambled to get one last playoff, as incompletions didn't stop the clock under this set of timekeeping rules. The timekeeper blew his whistle to end the game an instant before the snap of the football, but the referee did not hear him and play continued. This time Parks received it and fired to the end zone for Scotty Rutherford. Rutherford leapt, reached over a defender, and snatched the ball from above. Two hours passed before, eventually, TCU was declared the winner. The official ruling was that the timekeeper did blow his whistle prior to the final snap, but the referee did not blow his, and the referee's whistle ends the game. Baylor head coach Bubs Mosley sent a telegram to football legend Walter Camp, then chairman of the College Football Rules Committee, but he backed up the official decision. The Bears have now finished their season, 0-6, in heart-shredding 12-7 final second fashion. This is the pit in which all hope dies. A bit over a week later, the Baylor Laureate published its final paper that mentions the football team in 1918. There's a team photo, a positive subhead about the team's willpower, that's it. No article, no yearly recap. The general university struggles are, however, addressed in a much larger sense. An article entitled, What Have You Done?, speaks of the hardships encountered by Baylor over the past three months. A wave of the influenza epidemic, military recruits coping with new lives in the SATC, only to have it disbanded, and plenty of other trials and tribulations. Yes. Some have drunk the bitter cup of disappointment, the article reads. Ambitions have been thwarted. And yet, are we going to succumb to discouragement and failure? Will they drag us into the depths of despair? Rise up! Catch the gleam that rises through the mists. You know, when I was researching this series, my original idea was to explore an alternate reality where college football no longer exists because of the influenza epidemic and the inherent dangers of the sport. Plenty of people died playing football before World War I. I had a whole bit about the multiverse. Justin Fields and Trevor Lawrence were going to be competing as opposing center mids for the Ohio State and Clemson soccer teams. It was a fun idea. But early on in the writing process, I discovered two things. I can't spin fiction in a meaningful and engaging way, at least not like the true stories I found while I was researching this year of football. And I couldn't actually justify the sport ending after 1918 
even if that season and the next were, say, canceled because of the epidemic and the war. The perseverance of the human spirit never ceases to amaze me. You can bet. Even after the 0-6 year and the heartbreaking finish, the Bayer Laureate was singing its team's praises again before the 1919 campaign. And you can bet, come whatever time we return to some semblance of normalcy in this country, we'll be even stronger for having gone through what we've been through. That's enough rambling from my ugly mug. Our last team to cover is my favorite from 1918. Now at the beginning I told you the story of how George Hallis unwittingly escaped death in his youth, but I didn't carry it on from there. Hallis, the eventual Hall of Fame player, coach, and papa of the Bears, missed the boat that day in 1915 because he was trying to gain weight to make a Big Ten, sorry, Western Conference football team. Hallis made the squad at Illinois in 1918 but entered the military during the season as an ensign. He didn't stray too far, however, landing in North Chicago at the Great Lakes Naval Training Station. And as with most military outposts at that time, they had a collegiate squad. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to you the best college football team you've never heard of. In 1918, Great Lakes Naval Academy outscored opponents 155-27 to and managed shutouts in six of nine games. The second biggest star for the Blue Jackets behind Hallis was another future Pro Football Hall of Famer, halfback Patty Driscoll. Driscoll had already played professional football, winning the Indiana State Championship as the Hammond Clabbies' star quarterback in 1917 and he was tougher than a $2 Costco steak. There are many football fans who don't know of the wonder of drop kicking. See, buried within the football rule book, bouncing a football off the ground and kicking it is a viable replacement to your typical extra point or field goal setup in the modern game. In 1918, drop kicking was considered a viable tactic to grab one or three points. During the Clabbies' state championship run, Driscoll was knocked unconscious in the third quarter, re-entered the game, and converted a 55-yard drop kick to put Hammond ahead two scores. The team won 13-3. 55 yards in 1917, after being knocked unconscious, while also playing quarterback. Think about that. And that was before he arrived to play with Hallis and company. In Great Lakes Navy's highest scoring contest that season, Driscoll accrued six touchdowns after his team went down 14-0 against Rutgers to rout the Scarlet Knights 54-14. And there was yet another future pro football Hall of Famer with Driscoll and Hallis, quarterback Jimmy Konzelman. Konzelman made waves wherever he went. In his rookie season as a pro with the Decatur Staleys, he played halfback, punter, place kicker, and threw passes when the offense called for it. In 1927, with the Providence Steamrollers, he missed the second half of the season with twisted knee ligaments and still wound up as the MVP of the team. Throw in multiple former Notre Dame and Big Ten stars, and you have a juggernaut of a first-year football team. Somehow, though, Great Lakes Navy didn't capture a national championship finishing the season with seven wins and two ties. Northwestern was the first tie, a scoreless 48-minute affair played on a field ankle-deep in mud. Neither team could find traction, players slipped all over the place, and the teams dodged safeties like central-powered bullets. Unfortunately for our Great Lakes champions, Northwestern finished a meager 2-2-1 on the season, ruining their chances for national title honors alongside the unbeaten and untied teams of college football that year. The next week, Hallis' Blue Jackets hit the road to face Notre Dame, a one-loss team in the middle of a dominant era. The Fighting Irish were led by a halfback named Earl Lee Lambeau, better known as Curly. 
he later founded the Green Bay Packers. That's right, just a year or two before the franchises they catalyzed formed one of the NFL's greatest rivalries, Curly Lambeau and George Hallis played against each other during a pandemic while one served in the military. They battled to a 7-7 tie. Poetic. After the draw, Notre Dame's head coach praised the 1918 Great Lakes Naval Academy team as, quote, the greatest I'd ever seen. But he was a first-year head coach, a former player with a pharmacy degree hired in a panic after the old coach left to tend to his family. The new play caller didn't even have prior experience at the helm of a program. What was his name again? K. Ken Canute. Rockney. Oh, here are my notes, it says he became a college football Hall of Famer, winning three national titles in 13 years with five perfect seasons as Notre Dame's head coach. And there's a movie about it. So maybe he does know something about football. Outside those two draws, no one could take down the Blue Jackets. Even Navy, who won each of its other four games that season by a combined score of 277-13, to fell at home to the base from Lake Michigan. Great Lakes Navy capped off its campaign in front of 26,000 fans, huge numbers in those days, at the 1919 Rose Bowl, the final game of the 1918 college football season, defeating the undefeated Mare Island Marines 17-0 in a game that is largely credited with bringing football back from its 1918 dark place. Hallis caught a 30-yard touchdown pass from Driscoll and returned an interception 80 yards to ice the game late. The pandemic was beginning to pass. The SATC was disbanded. Military outposts, for the most part, no longer had teams and college football returned to its pre-war state as murmurings of a new National Football League began. The sport was moving forward. Thus ended the 1918 season, one of calamity, presidential interference, military influence, wild tales, and triumph. Fan interest in college football skyrocketed in the following years due to marquee players like the Four Horsemen and Red Grange. Attendance rose throughout the 1920s. 1918 may have been a roller coaster too dangerous for college football to hop onto but it was a ride like none other. Ten million soldiers to the war have gone, who may never return again. Ten million mothers' hearts must break for the one who died in vain. Heads bowed down in sorrow in her lonely years. I heard a mother murmur through her I brought him up to be my pride and joy. Okay, hey, unscripted outro, Andy here. Uh, just wanted to say thank you for watching the video. Uh, if you liked it, please leave a like, uh, subscribe, you know, leave a comment if you have a question or if you just want to uh, make a comment on the video. I'll uh, be sure to respond to any questions people have. I uh, wanted to give special thanks to my younger brother, Garrett. was a huge help. Um, I gave him a rough estimation of what I wanted that bit with the machine for Baylor to look like. In 30 minutes, he tore apart an old reed whacker, mounted it, uh, found a way we could light it on fire, make it blow up, so to speak. Uh, so huge shout out to him. You saw him in the drop kicking segment. Um, also thanks to my roommates Mary Howard and Stephen Lowe who appeared in the video briefly, even if it was just their hand. Um, and I, uh, oh, I also wanted to say thanks uh, to John Boyce again, not that he knows who I am, but uh, he was a big help in inspiring this video. Obviously, uh, I'm gonna, if you've seen the video, his 222 to nothing Cumberland video uh, is very similar to 
a bit I used in this video. It's definitely inspired by it. Uh, I'll leave a link to that in the description for sure. Um, but yeah, thank you for watching. Uh, be sure to watch part one if you didn't. Um, subscribe. And uh, yeah, hopefully I will be back with more uh, videos like this in the near future. Thank you.